I'm Rebecca Clark Carey. I'm head of voice and text here at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and I will be the voice and text director on Richard II. And we're getting ready to start rehearsals on Tuesday, and I'm very excited about this project because it's an extraordinary, extraordinary play. My work on the show will largely focus on helping the actors to connect to the language, to get a sense of ownership of feeling like they are deep inside the rhythms of the language, the rhetorical structures of the language, the imagery of the language, the emotional logic of the language, and the journey of the language as characters. To do that, I generally start by listening. Uh, for the first week or so of rehearsals as they're reading the play, I listen to what the director has to say, what the actors have to say, what kind of questions and challenges are coming up, what they're bringing to it, where they're finding humor, where they're finding tragedy and emotion, and just gather all of that and appreciate everything that's on the table. Then I go into sessions with the actors, and we sit together and we work through the lines. And we look at, in the first instance, what's not completely crystal clear in terms of what the words mean, in terms of how a sentence is put together, but also in terms of why does this follow that? Why would you say that? So we work on developing that sense of clarity. Then we work on, well, what does this language offer us? Are there patterns of sounds that are repeated? Are there rhymes? What kind of choices does that give you as an actor? What does that indicate to you about what, how the character might be using the language to achieve a goal or an intention? How can we dig into that and really give it some juice and muscle so that it pops and flies and lands and has that desired effect on the listener, on the other people on the scene, and eventually on the audience? audience. One of the things that is unique about Richard II is it's the only play we have of Shakespeare's that's entirely in verse. There's no prose in this play. The verse is largely iambic pentameter, which simply means that every line is ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum 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 as its baseline rhythm, an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, five of those in each verse line. Prose doesn't follow any particular rhythmic pattern. And in most of Shakespeare's plays, there's a combination of verse and prose. And we find prose when we're dealing with characters of less noble status, or moments of intimacy, or moments of humor, and verse kicks in in moments of heightened emotion. Uh, something interesting that happens in Twelfth Night is in the scene between Viola and Olivia, where Viola's first come to woo, Olivia insists on speaking in prose. This is not going to be an exalted meeting. This is something that's going to be very everyday. I'm not going to accept this as being in any way romantic or important. And Viola, over the course of the scene, introduces verse and pulls Olivia into verse. In this play, it's all verse, which means that on one level, everything that happens in this play is heightened. The stakes are raised. People's investment is unabashedly strong in what they're saying, what they're hearing, what they're doing. It's relentless that way. So when I'm working on the actor, with working on it with the actors, we will be looking at how does that rhythm give shape and form to your intention. And just because the baseline rhythm is ba 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 doesn't mean that there are no variations. There's actually quite a bit of variation within that. Some strong stresses are stronger. Some are weaker. Sometimes Shakespeare introduces a ba ba instead of a ba ba. What does that syncopation do to help shape the thought as it lands on the listener's ear? So that's something that will be very particular to this play is investing in the verse in every single scene. In terms of helping the actors with their characterizations, uh, yes, we, we do spend a lot of time because, of course, the character is the language. That's all there is. We don't have extensive uh, descriptions of what they look like or what their background is that you might get in some more contemporary plays. All we have to go with is what they say. So we want to look at everything that might reveal a character's uh, 
state of mind, uh, character's emotional life, and use those clues to piece together what does this tell us about the whole person? What kind of person might say that and why? What kind of person might omit to say something else? Sometimes what isn't said is as interesting and revealing as what is said. I think that in some ways prose is harder than verse. Uh, And I wish that in drama schools and acting programs it was taught more. We tend to focus on verse when we're training young actors and teaching them all of the rhythmic variations. And that's great and that's important. And it is something that makes Shakespeare's language different from a lot of contemporary drama, which is all in prose. Having said that, the prose also has rhythm, and the prose also can have complicated syntax, and you don't have the revealing help of the meter to help you understand, well, what is most important in this line, in this sentence, in this thought, in this paragraph? Uh, So in some ways, I think verse can be easier because there are so many clues embedded in the structure of it that help you find your way to the hot spots, uh, to where you're going, where the thought is headed. Uh, So in that way, I, I love working on verse because it gives you so much to work with. I hope that audiences will hear the urgency in the language, the urgency in the story. Uh, This is a moment where the divine right of kings is being called into question. And I think it's a moment, not to be too topical, but that's very resonant in America right now. We have our own divine process (laughs) of choosing leaders, and we hold it sacred. What happens when a leader comes forward sanctioned by the divine right of a democratic vote, and yet many feel that he or she is unfit to lead? I think many of us are feeling that that pressure, that confusion, that panic, uh, and that's what this play is about. Uh, Everything that happens on stage has massive consequences for every character in this play. It is not only a life-defining moment for them, it's a nation-defining moment. Um, And it will have ramifications that play out for another couple centuries in England. And the next sequence of history plays track that. Bolingbroke challenged the king and said, you've broken the law, and the king crumbled and backed down and abdicated. What does that mean for Henry IV's kingship? What legitimacy does it have? What legitimacy does the kingship of his son have and his son? Uh, it, It reverberates with devastating consequences for generations. 